change can be complicated. Picture yourself at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Not the most pleasant fantasy, I know, but humor me here. You hope to go in as a person without a license and emerge as a person with a license. You stand in a line to take a ticket, which then qualifies you to wait in another line to speak to the representative or fill out a form, who you know all too well is going to give you that third line that you have to get in to have a photograph taken. Finally, you'll have your shiny new license. Now, taking a ticket is a pretty simple process. Let's say that 10 people a minute can get a ticket. Next is the painful part, dealing with the form submission at line two. One person per minute if you're lucky. Finally comes the cue for your photo. Now imagine that your cameraman's a pro and can get 10 people per minute through that line. Now comes the critical question. How fast can the DMV get customers through there with their new licenses? Well, you probably were able to figure out with simple logic that the rate will be one person per minute equal to the slowest process of the three. Next, imagine that the manager wants to speed the process along. So where do you put the extra workers? It matters. In our thought experiment, all the photographers in the world wouldn't speed up our process. Chemical reactions aren't all that different from this everyday example. You may recall that we thought briefly about this during our lecture on writing chemical reactions. Although, so far, we've assumed that chemical reactions are a direct transition from reactants to products, the time has come for us to finally admit that things are seldom that simple. Reactions are rarely a single concerted process, but rather often consist of several or many conversions happening in sequence, all of which add up to a more complex process in which our reagents ultimately become products but sample other states along the way. Chemists call these states intermediates, and they are unique from starting materials and products because they both form and are consumed in the reaction. In my previous example, a man holding a ticket might be an example of an intermediate. That is, a state that I both become and then move along from as the process continues. So let's move away from our analogy now and instead consider chemical reactions and how rates can help us to uncover their mechanisms. Most of the reactions that we've considered so far have been oversimplified. Recall that our early discussions about rate laws required that we assume the reactions take place in a single concerted step, meaning that the conversion from reactants to products happens directly, all at once, in a single collision of reactants. But the truth about chemical change is that it's rarely that simple. Just think about it from a probability standpoint. We sometimes classify reactions based on the number of molecules that must participate for a reaction to take place. When just one molecule reacts, we call that reaction unimolecular. Two would be a bimolecular reaction, and three molecules of reactants makes for a trimolecular reaction, and so on. Of course, reactions involving a single molecule can happen at any time with no collision needed at all but bonds must be vibrating, twisting, or in some other way moving just right to kick the reaction off. So no problem there, because bonds are always doing this at all temperatures but absolute zero. A bimolecular reaction would require that two molecules find each other and collide in just the right orientation and do so with just the right amount of energy to promote the process. A bit less likely. But imagine even more complex reactions with greater numbers of reactants, like most combustion reactions, for example. If methanol combustion were an elementary reaction, three molecules, two of oxygen and one of methanol, would have to all collide simultaneously, all in the proper orientation and all with sufficient energy for that reaction to take place. The combustion of ethanol would require that four molecules do so. And it should become clear very quickly that the likelihood of such a confluence of collisions would be so very rare that such a reaction wouldn't happen at all. And yet, we know these reactions happen. In fact, they happen quite vigorously when the reagents are combined in proper proportions and a small spark sets them off, providing that initial activation energy. So, clearly, these processes have to happen differently. 
Now, what if instead of colliding all at once, the reaction took place in a stepwise fashion? What if one molecule of oxygen reacts with methanol to form something different, an intermediate? Then the intermediate could react with another oxygen in a second simple step. In order to better understand reactions and how to manipulate them, we need to understand exactly what's happening at the level of chemical bonds, which bonds break and form, and also in what order. Reactions often happen in a stepwise fashion, just like our experience at the DMV, and that those different steps each take place at their own rates, also just like our example. Through a process of sequentially breaking and forming bonds, the materials reacting transition from one species to another, then another, until the final product is formed. Some changes take place very early in the process and some much later. And some happen rapidly and others happen more slowly. And all of the individual steps play an important role in the completion of the reaction. So clearly, multi-step mechanisms are critical for us to understand. But how do we decipher this puzzle? How is it possible to determine the mechanism or set of elementary steps that converts one material to another when they're all going on in concert over a vast sample of moles of molecules inside of a reaction mixture on a lab bench? At a glance, it seems like a puzzle that's impossible to solve. Without the ability to simply watch a handful of chemicals react, how can we possibly acquire this knowledge? The answer to this question comes from chemical kinetics, the very rate laws that we're studying during this segment of the course. We saw a few lectures ago how, in the case of elementary reactions, rate laws are relatively straightforward to determine. The order of the reaction is equal to the molecularity of the reaction. In other words, an elementary reaction involving a single reactant will always be first order. An elementary reaction involving two reactant molecules will always be second order overall. But when we begin to consider processes which happen in a stepwise fashion, things change. Just like in our real world example, the speed of the processes is dictated by the speed of the slowest step. We call the slowest step in a process the rate determining step for that process, sometimes also called the rate limiting step. What's so important about the rate limiting step is that just like in our example of the DMV, it will be the determining factor in the speed of the overall process. In this case, our chemical reaction. Remember that the second line in the DMV was the one holding us up and the output of satisfied customers was dictated by the rate at which that line moved. Chemical reactions are exactly the same. The speed with which we get to that line has something to do with how fast we finish our chore. But once we pass the slowest step in the process, the effect of all the subsequent steps that we go through becomes totally negligible. When we extend our everyday analogy of multi-step processes into the realm of chemistry, we can start to model more complicated reactions than those which we did in our previous lectures on rates. Let's take the example of a generic reaction mechanism in which we have two reactants, A and B, which come together somehow to form products. Previously, we always assumed that when a reaction like this took place, it was an elementary reaction in which A collides with B and the product is formed in a single concerted step. When this is the case, we expect the rate law for this reaction to be K, the rate constant, times the concentration of A raised to the first power times the concentration of B raised to the first power. Simple enough. But let's take that a step farther and ask ourselves, what if this is not actually how the reaction takes place? What if instead it goes through some type of mechanism which requires multiple elementary steps to take place in a sequential fashion? So let's uh, propose a mechanism here. In my proposed mechanism, first, a reacts to form some other intermediate species we'll call X, which then reacts with B to create our final product. So this would be a two-step process or a mechanism. So our first step in our mechanism would be the conversion of A into X. And our second step, the reaction of that intermediate X with B to form the final product. 
This means that there are two elementary rate laws that we have to consider. The first being K1 for the first step times concentration of A, the reactant in that first step. But we also have to consider the possibility that a second step in our process affects rate. As an elementary process, that particular one is K2, I'm calling it K2 because it's our second step, times the concentration of B raised to the first power, times the concentration of the intermediate X also raised to the first power. So how do we use those elementary rate laws to try to figure out what's going on in the case of a multi-step reaction? Well, think about this. I've redrawn the mechanism here a little bit differently than on the previous slide so that we can illustrate what happens when the roles of these two steps changes. Now, right now I've got it set up so that I can clearly see the overall reaction is A plus B forms products. But in this particular mechanism, I'm going to stipulate that the first step is fast and the second step is the slow step. So the rate limiting step of my mechanism is the reaction of B with the intermediate X to form the final products. Now when this is the case, and I consider the two elementary rate laws here, I have to consider them both because the rate limiting step happens at the end of the process. In other words, my overall reaction is going to be some rate constant K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B as well. Because I have substituted, essentially rearranged this equation in terms of the intermediate forming rather than A being consumed, and then substituted it into my lower rate equation for x. And doing so gives me my new rate law. So let's think a little bit about how things will change if I change the role of each step. Again, simple uh, two-step reaction mechanism, just like before. Here are my individual rate laws, and everything cancels to show me my overall reaction, just as I did before. But let's make one very important change. This time, let's change the role of these steps. Let's make the first step slow and the second step fast. So step two now is something like the photographers in our DMV example. They already go really fast. We don't need to speed them up. In fact, speeding them up won't change the reaction anymore. What I've essentially done here by changing which is the slow step is I've rendered that second step completely unnecessary in considering the rate law. So now when I determine the rate law for my mechanism, all I have to consider is the first step because that is the rate limiting step. So in this case, there is no rearranging in terms of X and substituting into the rate law for the second step. I simply report the rate law for the first step, K for the reaction times the concentration of A. Now that we have mastered modeling generic mechanisms and how they would change rate laws, let's think a little bit more about a specific mechanism. Uh, let's look at this reaction. The reaction between NO2 and CO to form NO and CO2. Now let's say that we go into the laboratory and we actually determine the rate law for this chemical reaction by running it under various conditions of concentration and measuring its initial rates, just as we did in our previous lecture. And that after all that work, we determine that the rate law for this reaction is K times the concentration of NO2 squared. Now, what does that information tell us immediately? Well, it tells us immediately that this cannot possibly be an elementary reaction. If this were an elementary reaction, what would we expect the rate law to be? Well, it would be NO2 colliding with CO in a concerted process, thereby creating a rate law of K times the concentration of NO2 to the first power times the concentration of CO to the first power. Yet, we did not observe that in the laboratory. So this can't possibly be the case. This reaction has to proceed through a more sophisticated mechanism. But what is that mechanism? Well, there are some clues in the rate law, at least. It lets us know that NO2 is a bigger player in this reaction than an elementary process would suggest. So we want to come up with a mechanism that uses more molecules of NO2. So my proposed mechanism will involve the reaction of two NO2s to form NO3 plus NO, and then subsequently that NO3 will react with carbon monoxide to form my final products. In my proposed mechanism, I've got my initial step as fast and my second step as being slow. So a quick check of my mechanism tells me that it does add up to the overall process. Naturally, that's a requirement. And my elementary rate laws for each step would be K times NO2 squared for my first and K times NO3 times CO concentration for the second. Now, when I 
Think about the overall rate law for this mechanism. I have to consider both of my elementary steps because I've designated my second reaction as the slow reaction. And when I do this, what I find out is that the overall rate law has to be K times NO2 squared times CO. So by including that second step, I've included one of the reagents that I know shouldn't have an effect on rate. In other words, this mechanism as written cannot possibly be accurate because its rate law is inconsistent with my observed rate law. But we're not done yet. We have one more recourse. Let's go back and reset. But instead of considering this mechanism as I've written it, let's make one very important change. Let's consider what happens when I switch the slow and fast steps. Now I've made the first reaction the rate limiting step. Right? My second elementary reaction doesn't have any effect on the rate whatsoever, so I don't have to consider it at all when determining the rate law. Now it becomes fairly simple, doesn't it? The rate law for the overall process is simply equal to the rate law for the slow step because it's the first step. In other words, the rate for my reaction using this mechanism is expected to be some value of K times the concentration of NO2 squared, exactly the same as my measured rate. So when we look back on our proposed mechanism, we see that the rate law from experimental data is consistent with our final proposed mechanism. Does this prove with absolute certainty that our mechanism is correct? No, but it does prove that the others were incorrect. By carefully considering all reasonable mechanisms and rate data for a given reaction, chemists can often come to a realistic understanding of how molecules interchange even in some of the most complex processes. So we started our discussion on rates using elementary reactions, those with only reactants and products, species which form and are consumed in a reaction respectively. But in this lecture, we graduated to considering a new level of complexity, stepwise reaction mechanisms, which are far more common. We met a new class of materials in reactions to go along with reactants and products, the intermediate. Materials which form during an early step, but are consumed later during a subsequent step. Uh, the NO3 from our previous example would be one of these intermediates. So we've considered materials that are consumed in reactions. Those would, of course, be the reactants or reagents. We thought about what's formed, and of course those are the products. And we just considered materials that form early, but are later consumed in a multi-step reaction, intermediates. But there's one last permutation that we have not yet considered. What about a material which is present at the start of a reaction, consumed in an early step, but is then produced again in a subsequent step? The first question on your mind might be, why would we ever do such a thing? Really? We're going to add a reactant that we know is just going to be regenerated at the end of a mechanism. What's the point of that? Well, the point is simply this, that the presence of that special material can sometimes alter the mechanism of a reaction drastically. Sometimes such a species can take a reaction mechanism down a whole new road, one which requires less activation energy and therefore can happen faster. I actually already slipped a catalyst into this course very subtly. Remember that I had to add a bit of material to the container when we decomposed hydrogen peroxide solutions? Well, that was one of these special classes of materials. It was there to participate in the reaction without being consumed by the reaction. So what was it doing there? It was influencing the rate of the reaction, speeding them up so that we could observe them in seconds instead of days. When the addition of a material speeds a reaction without consuming that material itself in the overall reaction, we call the process catalysis. And the chemical that speeds that reaction without being consumed is called a catalyst. When we discussed this reaction originally, we made a qualifying assumption that it was an elementary first order reaction but it's time for me to come clean and confess a little white lie. We assumed that the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide was an elementary unimolecular decomposition process, 
because of this assumption, we could track the reaction's energy and get a nice, simple energy diagram in which a single transition state forms on the way to the products, water and oxygen. But the catalyst that I added, a small amount of potassium iodide, changed all of that by participating in the reaction when it was dissolved into the peroxide solution. It formed an intermediate with the peroxide, which is lower in energy than the transition state for the uncatalyzed reaction. Now, in doing this, I altered the mechanism of the reaction, creating a two-step mechanism in which the transition states for both steps form faster than the transition state for the uncatalyzed reaction. This new pathway, with a faster rate-limiting step, occurs much more quickly, regenerating the catalyst at the end of the process so that it can continue its action without being consumed in the overall process. <sighs> Feels good to come clean finally. Now, on with our discussion of catalysis. It was Johns Jacob Berzelius who coined a term in 1835, using the Greek word meaning pick up or dissolve as the root for his new discovery. Catalysis. It's a remarkable thing. Not only because of how useful it can be to have control over the speed of a reaction for scientific study and demonstration, but because of how commonly we see it, even in nature. Berzelius noticed that certain noble metals, like platinum, could speed certain reactions involving hydrogen gas. This is a fact used in food processing plants all around the world today, where platinum and other metals like it are used to speed the process of adding hydrogen to vegetable oils to form what are known as partially hydrogenated oils. These oils have a longer shelf life. We would call this class of catalyst a heterogeneous catalyst because it involves multiple phases of matter. Our earlier example involved iodide in solution interacting with peroxide, also in solution. So that would be considered a homogeneous catalysis. Heterogeneous catalysis requires a bit more engineering because heterogeneous catalysis, like a solid platinum surface, provide a catalytic surface on which liquid and gas materials can bind to the surface, or adsorb, where they react, form products, and those products then desorb from the surface, making room for more reactant to adsorb and repeat. This, of course, means that more surface area means a more effective catalyst in this situation. Your car's catalytic converter uses a heterogeneous catalyst, usually of platinum and rhodium, to modify the gas exhaust of your vehicle to protect the environment. Now, because of this, the catalyst itself is molded into a honeycomb-like structure to maximize the amount of exposed surface area. This, in turn, minimizes the amount of these precious metals needed to carry out the catalysis, which is a good thing because platinum and rhodium are both far more expensive than gold. But the amazing influence of catalysis in our lives doesn't stop with noble metals like platinum. In fact, some of the most powerful catalysts known to man are at work inside your body right now. The idea of biological catalysts was championed by Edward Buchner, who found in 1897 that the extract of yeast cells known to carry out fermentation could actually carry out the process even when no living yeast were present. This observation forever changed the way that chemists look at living organisms. It made us realize that life itself is a composite of thousands of chemical reactions, each of which is moderated by special catalysts that our body manufactures to keep everything running smoothly. These special biological catalysts are called enzymes. These enzymes are designed to speed an array of chemical reactions that keep you alive, from phosphorylating ADP to help you manage energy, to breaking down unwanted molecules in your bloodstream to prepare them for removal, to repairing chemically damaged DNA. Enzymes are truly the caretakers of your body's chemistry. Now, you might think of enzymes as manufacturing equipment on an assembly line. The equipment is all designed to speed the conversion of parts into products, 
all while maintaining its own integrity so that it can be used again and again to efficiently promote the desired process. It participates in the process, but it's not consumed. But what is really stunning is the kind of rate acceleration that enzymes can achieve for certain reactions. Enzymes can speed many reactions by a factor of a million, a billion, or a trillion times, sometimes even more. This incredible catalytic power has led to enzymes being used in a variety of commercial products like detergents, where they catalyze the chemical breakdown of proteins and fats to remove stains. Now, we'll investigate enzymes in detail in another lecture, but they're worth mentioning here because their ability to accelerate very specific reactions by tremendous factors is unrivaled by any other catalyst known. Without them, the complex chemical symphony going on within our bodies would be utterly impossible. The human race itself owes its very existence to this class of catalysts. So let's sum up our discussion. We started by considering that change doesn't always take place in a single concerted step. Many process, processes with which we are familiar actually happen in a stepwise fashion. Now we saw how chemical reactions often take the same approach, converting starting materials into metastable intermediates, which are then converted into products. Each of these simple transitions that add up to a larger process are called elementary steps, and the overall process is called a reaction mechanism. We saw how each elementary step has its own associated rate law, and how the slowest step in a process, called the rate limiting step, dictates the rate law for a proposed mechanism, rendering all subsequent steps negligible from a rate law perspective. We spent some time analyzing and experimentally determining a rate law to try to confirm or reject proposed mechanisms. Now, we did this by observing the effect of not only changing the steps themselves, but which step is designated as limiting, then looking for a mechanism consistent with our rate law. Finally, we discussed catalysis, the process by which the presence of a chemical speeds a reaction without actually consuming that chemical. We saw how a wide array of catalysts exist, some heterogeneous, like Brazilius's noble metals, and others homogeneous, like the iodide that so efficiently speeds the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide and enzymes in your own bloodstream. By now, it should be clear that reaction rates matter. They can help us determine the process by which chemicals interconvert and find new ways to alter those rates by catalysis to create new products and understand how living systems moderate all of the chemical reactions that support them. But so far, we've only considered reactions that move in one direction, creating products from reactants in a one-way chemical street that can never be reversed. But what happens when we change our perspective? How do we deal with reactions in which some of the products we form begin to revert to starting materials, even as the reaction is taking place? We call this situation chemical equilibrium. And our next lecture will start a journey toward understanding and using this kind of process to our advantage.